Well, good morning. And for all of those who are visiting for the first time, I want to say welcome in the name of Jesus. Seems like we've been having visitors uh, consecutively just week after week, and that's so good. We're so happy that you're here with us. Well, this morning we are going to continue in our series in the Gospel of Matthew. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn them with me to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9, along with verses 18 through 23. Uh, we're skipping verses 10 through 17 because we looked at that last week, where there was a little bit of an interlude in which the disciples asked Jesus as to why he spoke in parables. And so last week we considered the meaning and the purpose of parables, and now I think we're ready to jump into each individual parable. So today we consider the parable of the sower. So Matthew chapter 13, beginning to read in verse 1. It says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in, in another sixty, and in another 30. This is the word of the Lord. In this parable, Jesus was teaching about various responses that people have to the message of the kingdom. And he was illustrating the different kinds of responses people have to the gospel message in terms that they were familiar with. As Jesus was sitting beside the Sea of Galilee with great crowds around him, listening to him teach, he spoke about a man who went to sow seed in a field. And he then went on to describe the effect the seed had upon the four different soils that it landed on. Now, these agricultural realities of which Jesus spoke about was common knowledge in that day. And so Jesus was speaking on their level, and everyone in the crowds that were tuning in that day would have been able to understand what he was talking about, because ancient Israel was an agrarian society. Everyone was familiar with farming, because even if farming wasn't your profession, and say fishing was, you still would have had a friend or a neighbor that did farm. Now, I think that this parable is going to resonate with you because I know that we have many seasoned farmers and gardeners in our congregation. And to be quite frank, I think that many of you, with all of your experience and expertise in this area, are a little bit more qualified than I am to speak on some of these things. And so just know that after this sermon, the questions are going to be coming your way this time. 
All right, well, there are three main components to this parable. Number one, there is the sower. Secondly, there is the seed. And third, there is the soil. But the dominant emphasis in this parable lies upon the soils. And so while most headings in our Bible call this the parable of the sower, it would be equally true, if not more so, to call this the parable of the soils. And I'm sure that you well know that producing a good fruitful crop heavily depends upon the health of the soil. If the soil is good and has the right texture and is full of organic matter and is able to retain moisture and so on, then it is primed to grow a rich and beautiful crop. And so the health of the soil is key. But if the ground has not been rightly cultivated, then it will not allow the seed that was sown to yield a fruitful crop. Well, Jesus described four different kinds of soil upon which the soil fell, and only one of them produced good fruit, whereas the three other soils hindered the seed from growing. Now, what I want to do this morning um, as we walk through this parable is to walk through it one step at a time. I want us to look at one thing that Jesus said in his parable and then immediately consider his explanation of what he said in his parable. And so that means that we're going to be going back and forth between the parable itself and the explanation that Jesus gave to the parable. Now, first, we're going to consider who the sower is. Second, we'll consider what the seed is. And then third, we will consider what is represented by the various soils. And that third point is really going to occupy most of our time. So let's begin with the sower. Look at verse 3. It says, And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. Now the interesting thing about this parable is that this is the only point that Jesus did not explain. I mean, he tells us what the seed is. He tells us what the soils represent. But he does not tell us who the sower is. However, if we look at the following parable, which is the parable of the wheat and the weeds, I think that it may offer us a little bit of help here. Because in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And when you look at the interpretation of that parable, Jesus tells us who the sower is. If you look at verse 36 in Matthew 13, it says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The one who sowed good seed in the parable of the wheat and the weeds is Jesus. Jesus was the sower. Now, let me say that we do need to be careful about taking one truth from a parable and saying that it automatically applies to another parable because that doesn't always work. However, this does seem to be an instance where we are safe in assuming that Jesus is the sower in both parables. So the sower that went out to sow is the Son of Man. During the ministry of Christ, Jesus was sowing seeds into the hearts of everyone who was listening to him. And I just want to remind you that we are the ones, as Christians, who have been called to carry on this ministry. As Christians, we have the duty to sow seeds. That is, we have the responsibility to tell others about Jesus. You see, we are all sowers called upon to tell other people about the sower. Uh, The entire church has been commissioned by Christ to fulfill this mission of sharing the gospel and discipling those who embrace the gospel by faith. And so no one is exempt from this responsibility. Now, let me also say that, of course, we do not have the power to produce life. Uh, We can only tell people where to find life But at the same time, people cannot be given life unless they hear where it can be found. And so our job is to simply sow seeds and then pray for God to give the growth because only God can do that. And how joyful 
it is when we obey the Lord and God in His kindness causes the seed to germinate and produce a crop. As Psalm 126 verse 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. All right, so Jesus is the sower, but as ambassadors of the king who serve in his kingdom, we too are also to sow the seed. But this raises the question, what are we to sow? I mean, what kind of seed are we sowing? Well, Jesus tells us what the seed is. Look at verses 18 and 19 or just verse 18 here, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom. The seed that we are to plant in people's lives is the word of the kingdom. And the word of the kingdom is the message that people need to hear in order for them to enter the kingdom. You see, everyone born into this world is born into Satan's kingdom. Outside of Christ, everyone belongs to the domain of darkness. But the good news is that there is a message that has the power to set people free from the kingdom of darkness by transferring them into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The word of the kingdom is the good news of the kingdom. It is the good news that sinful people, spiritually dead people, and God-rejecting people can be forgiven and can be granted eternal life and find liberty by entering into the kingdom of God. The word of the kingdom is the message of salvation that is recorded and preserved for us in the word of God. In fact, in Luke's recording of the parable of the sower, it says this in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. It says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And so the Word of God is the seed that we are to scatter into the soil of people's hearts. Because just as a plant cannot be produced without a seed, so a Christian cannot be produced without hearing the Word of God. Moreover, just as being physically born into the world occurs through the means of a perishable seed, so being spiritually born into the kingdom of God occurs through the means of of an imperishable seed. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 through 25 it says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. For someone to enter the kingdom of God, they must be born again. And they are born again the way or the means in which God causes someone to be born again is is that it is incumbent upon them to to come into contact with the word of god and the truth of the word of god must pierce their hearts in such a way that they come under the conviction of sin and understand their need for a savior you see we must not only know the truth we must experience the life-giving power of the truth because without it having that effect, then no life will ever sprout from the seed. All you'll have is a seed that has never been watered. And for some people, that is all they have ever known about the seed. They've heard the truth, but they've never been changed by it. And we can see this clearly in the soils And this is where I want to turn our attention to the different kinds of responses people have to the message of the kingdom. In this parable, Jesus teaches about four different responses people have to the message of the kingdom, and those responses are represented under the imagery of four different kinds of grounds or soil that the seed lands on. There is the hard soil. 
there is the rocky soil there is the thorny soil and then there is the good soil but consider the hard soil look at verse 4 it says and as he sowed some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them this would have been a very understandable truth for people living in Palestine because it was common for farmers to accidentally drop seeds along the path as they walked through their fields. Uh, paths were like roads that ran through the fields and people were free to walk on them. But with so many people walking along those paths, it caused them to become very hard and compacted uh, such that it was impossible for these seeds to penetrate through the ground. And so the seeds just ended up sitting on top of the ground, which allowed the birds to get a nice free snack out of it. But what does Jesus mean by this? Well, look at his explanation in verse 19. He says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path the seed that was sown along the, the hard path represents a person who entirely misunderstands the message of the gospel and completely rejects it it is the person that wants nothing to do with the church nothing to do with christianity nothing to do with the bible it is a person that simply doesn't care about the things of god it is the atheist who says there is no God, or it is a person that at least lives with the mentality of an atheist. Eat, drink, and be merry, because that's all there is to life, says the person along the path. The heart of the person along the path simply shows no interest over the things of God and over the state of their own soul. Now, they may hear the word of God, but they show no care for it and no eagerness to hear from it. And so whatever truth they may have been exposed to, Satan just comes and snatches it away. And that's the hard path. But then there is the rocky soil. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. You know, much of the land in Israel is rocky ground. Uh, rocky ground is when there is some soil, but there's not much of it. And so when the seeds fell on this kind of soil, rather than it slowly deepening its roots into the ground, it immediately springs upward because it has nowhere to go downward. Now, when the plant rises, at first sight, it looks healthy. It looks beautiful on the outside. But the problem is that there is no depth to the soil, and that means that the plant will not be able to last very long. Because as soon as the sun rises, it's just going to be baked by the sun. The sun's going to bake the plant because it isn't receiving enough moisture to withstand the heat. Well, look at what Jesus tells us about this soil in verse 21. Uh, verse 20 and 21 he says as for what was sown on rocky ground and this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word immediately he falls away if you have been a christian for a while you know the truthfulness of these words. I mean, how many people have you seen profess faith in Christ for a while, but then turn their backs on Him? That's what Jesus was speaking about here when He spoke about the rocky soil. Now, there are people who come into the church, and they hear the gospel, and they immediately receive the Word of God with a whole lot of joy. And by all appearances, it really looks like God has saved them. It looks like the real deal. I mean, they look like a new creation in Christ, but beneath the surface, there is a problem with their faith. It is built on shallow ground, 
rather than being deeply rooted into the soil of grace. And so, when the circumstances of life get tough, in particular the Christian life, whenever they get tough, there is a backing away from spiritual things. Sometimes it is a slow fade, and sometimes it's just completely out of the blue. All of a sudden, they're gone. But why? Well, when the trials get too tough, they begin to think that the Word of God is insufficient for their felt needs. Now, they may be happy it works for you, but for them, they feel as if they need something else. And so they walk away from the truth. Now, it's not always tribulation, and it's not always persecution, which causes them to fall away, because from Luke's gospel, we can see that it is even more comprehensive than that, because Luke mentions temptation. If the truth be told, there are a variety of things that cause professing believers to fall away from the living God, but it is important to note that the reason why they fall away is because they were never truly rooted in the faith to begin with. They went out from us because they were not of us. And so the rocky soil represents the person whose true colors come to light when the heat of the sun rises over them. Therefore, it is a false Christian that is unable to persevere. It is a professing Christian that proves in time to be a false Christian. Now there is the thorny soil. Look at verse 7. It says, Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Uh, So these seeds were falling on untilled ground. Uh, The soil was infested with briars and thorns, so that when the seeds fell among it, it just choked the life right out of them. Now Jesus interprets what he means by this in verse 22. He says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. You know, out of all the soils mentioned, I think that this one is perhaps the scariest one to be. Uh, This is describing the kind of person who will stand before God on the day of judgment, saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The person depicted by the thorny soil is the religious person. It is the church attender. It is a person who sits under the preaching of God's Word. It is a person who is even orthodox in their doctrine. It is a person who would emphatically declare themselves to be a Christian, and they may have gone to church all the days of their life. But again, there is a problem. The cares of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life and self-dependence, and the deceitfulness of riches. Fame, popularity, and power keeps the truth from having free access and free reign into this person's heart. And so while they may acknowledge the truth with their head, the things of this fallen world crowds their heart such that it chokes the word, so that it never actually takes up residence within the person. Now, make no mistake, these people know the Christian lingo. They have a form of religion, but no power. They have the right creed, but if push comes to shove, they hold on to their religiosity because it advances their own self-seeking purposes. Thus, they prove unfruitful. Unfruitful. And there is no such thing as an entirely fruitless Christian. And therefore, the thorny soil represents a person who may believe the right things, but ultimately, they are trusting in themselves. They may not deny the Trinity. They may not deny the inerrancy of Scripture or the exclusivity of Christ, but at the end of the day, they are enamored 
by the things of this world more than they are Christ. But then there is the good soil. Look at verse 8. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The good soil is soil that is fertile and receptive. It is not shallow. It is not rocky. It is not crowded with thorns. It is well-cultivated ground for seeds to be planted. And since the condition of the soil is healthy, it guarantees the production of good fruit. We'll look at verse 23 to see Jesus' Jesus' explanation on this matter. He says, As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and in another thirty. According to Jesus, every Christian has a new heart that is responsive to a certain degree to the Word of God, but not every Christian bears equal amount of fruit. You see, we are all at different stages in our journey with the Lord, and we are all bearing various degrees of good fruit. Some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty, but none zero. Now, the reason why we do bear fruit is because the seed, which is the Word of God, has penetrated our hearts. And church, I would just remind you that our hearts have not always been good soil. Uh, There was a time when our hearts responded to God in the way outlined by the first three soils. But then something happened. And what is it that changed? Well, God did a supernatural work of grace within us whereby he plowed the fallow ground. He removed those stones and he tore away those thorny briars in order to make the soil of our hearts healthy. You know, I love what God said through the prophet Ezekiel and Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, where he said, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to obey my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So the good soil brings forth good fruit because the soil has been conditioned to grow. And so in terms of our own practical daily living as Christians, we as disciples of Christ will be found to live out what has been implanted in us. Now, that does not mean that we're perfect. Because remember, the spiritual production of good fruit from Christian to Christian varies, which means that there is always room for growth. But here's the thing. The reality of growth and the reality of good fruit will never be completely absent. Well, I want to close by asking you a question. Where do you stand with God today? What soil represents your heart? And you can discover the condition of your heart by asking yourself this question. How do I hear? How do I hear? In verse 9, Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. You know, everything in this parable hangs on the condition of the soil. The problem isn't with the sower. The problem isn't with the seed. The problem is with the soil. And every soil, other than the fourth, has the seed sitting on sterile ground. In other words, it has the Word of God sitting on a heart that isn't truly hearing. And so I ask you, how does the Word of God sit with you when you hear it? And listen, I'm not asking you about how much good fruit that you've been producing in the last week. I'm asking you about what takes place within your heart when you hear the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, do you think to yourself, Oh Lord, 
Forgive me for where I've failed and where I've gone wrong. Lord, I want to be all that I can be for you, but Lord, I need your help. And so would you be so gracious to change me? If that's the kind of response that you have, then you can be pretty confident that the Word of God is landing on good soil. On the other hand, if you find yourself not wanting to hear from God's Word or becoming callous to what God has said or find yourself increasingly losing interest in the things of God or just living a life with the impression that it's okay to serve two masters, then you need to understand that all of that kind of thinking is proceeding from a heart that needs to be plowed by the Spirit of Almighty God. And you know, the good news is that God is gracious. He is merciful and He is gracious to transform all those who hear with the ears of their heart and who come to see their need for transformation. And my prayer and my admonition for all of us is that we would receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our souls. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we thank You for Your Word. And Lord, the seed of Your Word has fallen on many hearts today. And we ask in unison, O Lord, that You would implant Your Word into our hearts, that You would write Your eternal truth upon every one of our minds, hearts, and souls. God, I ask that you would change and transform the heart of anyone who is unresponsive to your word today, that is neglecting it, that is callous toward it, or that is under the impression that it's okay to serve two masters. Father, I ask that you would have mercy and that you would open up their eyes to see the reality of their sin in the light of your perfect purity and holiness, and that in seeing it, they would cast themselves upon the mercy of God and find forgiveness and salvation in Christ alone. Oh God, what a wonderful Savior you have provided. And I pray that you would give us a passion and an ambition to tell this lost world the good news of the kingdom, to go out scattering the good seed of the gospel, and we pray that you would produce a harvest of righteousness out of it. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.